Okay, look, we, we, we know that there's a, a wealth of experience joining us today um, and a wealth of great practice out there. So, so once again, this isn't, this isn't just a, a listening experience. Um, we're going to be using the halftime breakout rooms so that you guys all get a chance to, to chat um, about the, the, the topic of coaching on match day and what it means to your context and sharing those good ideas. And then again, at, at, after the official end, we'll replicate that that 10 minutes where you hang around the, the tea urn and you, you, you chat about um, everything that, that's happened. Okay? So we'll, we'll, for, for those people that want to stay on, we'll, we'll schedule that extra 10 minutes at the end as well. Um, but important, my job is, is a great one. I get to introduce the, the, the panel that we, we have today. Today's discussion is broadly based around coaching on match day. We don't really know what direction the, the conversation will go and, that, and that's good. Um, so it's coaching on match day, which is something we haven't done for a little while. Most of us certainly haven't done for a little while. But I know it's something that we, we think about a lot as, as coaches, a really important topic. And perhaps there's an argument that we spend a lot of time planning and evaluating our coaching sessions and looking to observe other people coaching. But perhaps game day, we don't do that so much. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to introduce the panel now. Uh, first person I'm going to introduce is, is Andy Foster. Andy is the Academy Coaching Manager at Leeds United. And he has a wealth of experience, having previously been in a similar role at the fellow championship club Middlesbrough. Andy has a really strong background in coach education, having been a national coach developer at the English FA, where Andy developed the people that would that deliver um, the FA's uh, coaching courses. And that's where I first met Andy. Um, Andy was the person that led me through um, me tutoring the uh, youth module. So great to see him again. And Andy, welcome. Morning, morning. And thank you, Gareth. Thanks. No problem. Secondly, I'd like to um, introduce Adam Lawrence, also from uh, the Championship. Um, Adam is the head of youth coaching, under nines to under 23s at Charlton Athletic. Adam holds the UEFA Pro Licence and FA Advanced Youth Award. Um, Adam has coached across the full spectrum of ages from under nines to senior men's. Um, like Andy, part of Adam's role is leading on coach development within his club. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks for having me. No problem. And our, our very own Warren Greve um, joins us for his second appearance on the panel. He's, he's, he's had the invite back, so that's good. Um, now, most of the people in, in, in New South Wales and Australia will, will, will know Warren um, from his roles across coach development and player development here in New South Wales. But Warren tonight today will also be drawing on his, his expertise and his time as technical director and head coach of Manly United FC here in the, the NPL in New South Wales. Hey, how's, how's it going, Warren? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Can I just ask people if, if you haven't already, if you could just make sure that your, uh, unless you're one of the panel, your, your camera's off, and that we, we'll definitely ask you to put them back on when we get into the breakout rooms. But uh, just just for now, if you can turn that off, um, Chris might go around and, and turn some of those off. Don't be offended. Okay, let, let's start then. Um, first question to you, Andy, and it's regarding coaching behaviours during match day, and. I'm interested in whether there are certain behaviours that we would see particularly um, from your academy coaches during a game and possibly are there some behaviours you don't want to see from your academy coaches? Um, good question. So as I was in preparation for doing this ses session, I started to think about where would I start with this question and I think I'll preface it by saying winning is important. I think that's probably the best starting point for me. Winning is important to the kids and it's important to the coaches as well. I think our, our role as coaches and coach developers is the process of winning um, and managing that. And obviously the, the, the main focus of that comes out on match days. So do I expect to see any particular behaviours? The answer to that is, is probably no, actually. Because the one thing I've learned from being at clubs in the last sort of three, four years and my time at the FA is that actually we're a game where the commodity we work with is people and there's such diversity of experiences, emotions, um, such as that. And we, we, if we try to take the emotion out of football for coaches, then obviously we take something of them away. So what I, I'm very clear on is I want my coaches to be, or my coaches, not my coaches, the club's coaches, I want them to be themselves. Because at the end of the day, they're going through a process as well as the players are. So the main, the, the main thing that underpins what we do is we'll have a process at the club of, like a lot of people will be familiar with, plan, do and review. So we'll plan what we intend for the game, 
we'll perform during the game and then we'll review it afterwards. So the, the during bit is still learning for the players and for the coaches as well. So I want the coaches to be themselves, essentially. Things you wouldn't see, or I would have issues with berating officials, overly criticising players during the games, arguing with the opposition, benches, and even, even within the context of this webinar, I suppose, getting involved with parents during the game, things like that. They're the type of things that are an absolute no-no. Um, but for me, let the coaches be themselves and obviously deal with whatever happens afterwards in the review process. Um, in terms of the way they interact with the players, I would prefer to see um, a positive, focused type of coach. So you catch the players doing things well, but also what you don't do is you don't ignore the things that you need to help the players with later on at some point. So I don't necessarily want coaches fixing things too quickly during the game. So they see a player make a mistake, the player knows he's made a mistake or she's made a mistake. So don't try to fix things too early. Give the player the opportunity to self-correct within the game because chances are those situations are going to occur again. What you do do is you focus on the praise stuff and then you make notes of the things you'd like to work on or talk to the players with afterwards. Um, and, and that would be it for me. So for me, the, the plan the review process is key because the review afterwards will be the performance of the players but also the performance of the coaches because you want your coaches to become more self-aware and have the ability to self-correct themselves as well or, or change and shape themselves for the future. Yeah, brilliant, Andy. And uh, I think probably most of us could uh, could definitely do that plan, do review more for our, our match day coaching. Thank you. That's great. Um, Adam, um, I want to focus on the first half of, of a game. Um, and I wonder what the roles of the coach during the first half of the game are. And not exclusively, but particularly, what, what are they focusing their observations on? Yeah, I think uh, when you start a game and, and you're taking a team and you're looking from the side of the pitch, you know, the first thing you're sort of looking for are just your individual players and how they're looking to, I guess, stamp their qualities and their, uh, you know, their mentality on the game. Uh, you know, obviously some of this can be dependent on the age group that you're working with and, and the group of players that you've got. But, you know, you obviously want, uh, you want a positive start to the game. You want to see a good energy, you know, uh, from, from the players in the group. Uh, and, and you want to see them, you, you're looking out for things like, are they demanding the ball? You know, are they getting on the ball? Uh, what's their energy like uh, when we haven't got it in terms of defensive phase? Uh, so then real sort of, uh, you know, little things that you just sort of look out for. Uh, but essentially, I think in a game of football, you're looking to impose yourself and, and your team and your group of players on the opposition. So that first sort of stage of the game, you're very much looking at how you're able to do that. Um, and, and if not, you know, why is that not happening? You know, are individuals not being brave enough uh, you know, do, do the other team have individually better players? Uh, is there something tactically that you can sort of influence as a coach? Um, so although the first 10 minutes of a game, you know, it seems like a short period of, of space, but it can be quite critical in terms of how the game started and, and the general mood and, and the energy. And uh, obviously, as you go up the age groups um, and, and you start to look more tactically at, at, the, at the game, um, one of the ways that I like to try and work anyway is if I'm leading a group of players and I'm focusing on us, so the team that I'm working with, uh, I would get an assistant or a second coach to look at the opposition. So, for instance, if you're taking an 18s or a 23s game, uh, I would then get the assistant coach to look at things like, uh, you know, what formation are they playing? Uh, you know, what's their style? Are there key things in the first 10 minutes of the game which show patterns in terms of how they're trying to play? Uh, and I think, you know, obviously as the half evolves, you look for things like, you know, who are the strong players standing out? Uh, where are the weaknesses uh, and any potential areas and zones of the pitch that you can exploit, you know, going forward. Uh, so that may not necessarily be evident in the first 10 minutes, but things that you may pick up later on. Um, and, and as coaches, I just think you can't neglect the feeling that you have at the start of a game or during the game. Uh, you know, Andy's mentioned about uh, the emotion of coaches and you're standing there and uh, you, you're looking at the feeling, you know, the, the feeling of the group uh, and the players and, and what the energy of the match is like. Uh, you know, is it a night game? You know, uh, is it during the day? What's the weather like? You know, the weather conditions, the referee. Uh, so all those little factors that you're trying to, trying to increase your knowledge of what's happening. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Interesting that it's uh, it's individuals, it's your team, but then it's also the, the opposition as well, but not neglecting those those feelings. Brilliant. Warren, uh, I wonder if you could take us through um, what a match day timeline looks like for you and, and equally if you have staff, how you how you manage their roles. Adam's given us an insight on what one of the things you might give to an, an assistant coach. Yeah, this uh, again, had a bit of time to think about this question and, and, and where I've related it to is my time at, at Manly uh, and very much in that performance phase where it is about getting the result. Uh, the three points at the weekend, if you're in a cup competition, getting the win to progress to the next round um, and working not at the top, top level professionally. It's more of a sub elite environment. So time is of the essence. Um, you're, you're definitely hamstrung by time. So maximizing your time um, in the plan and prepare phase. So when it comes to the conduct, uh, you, you hit the ground running and, and you're, best, you're not only best prepared, your staff are best prepared, but the players are as well, uh, understanding what the, the key messages are of what outcomes we want or what we're hoping to achieve from a technical, tactical point of view. So our week was all, is almost sort of like turned upside down, if you will. Um, and when it comes to match day, we'll do our video review um, before the game, but really our video review before the game is basically what we've worked on in that plan and prepare. Um, so you take in past, present and future. Um, what we did the week before leading into the, uh, the, the game that we've got this weekend uh, and going through that process continually. So we'll do a, a video review um, of us from the week before, the team that we've got, what we're expecting them to do in terms of how they set themselves up, what their shape is likely to be, who are the key individuals within uh, that team that might be the difference that we need to be aware of. And then from a uh, set pieces point of view, uh, for and against, again, where potentially they may, there may be dangers. So, so that, from a timeline point of view, would generally be about two and a half hours before before kickoff. If you was at the top, top level, you might do that the day before or even earlier in the morning if you're having breakfast with the players. But certainly in our environment uh, with, with Manly, like I say, it, it was done two and a half hours before. Very short and sharp. So no, no longer than sort of seven, eight minutes in terms of that video review. Uh, thinking about what players will retain, what they'll actually soak up. And you're hoping you've done the majority of the work during uh, your, your week anyway. So with the three to four contacts that you might have in the training environment, and then it's just turning on those light bulbs, getting players into that mindset and understanding of what they'd actually do. And as a, a finish, as I would finish with that video, you would always finish on the great things that we'd done um, in the weeks before and even before that as well. So it would always end on a positive note from a motivational point of view. So it would never be, be negative uh, information there um, and it would get the players and that, uh, ready for the game uh, mentally, mentally. Uh, in preparation for going out there and being physically ready. And uh, we would do that home and away. Now, for those listeners that are listening in uh, from New South Wales in particular and probably around Australia, that presents challenges in itself in terms of actually doing a re video review in a changing room that's the size of a shoebox. Um, you've got no access uh, to screen, et cetera. And um, Chris will attest to this because he followed me around on most away games, how we made it work. It was incredibly challenging to the point where we had a video projector on top of a dustbin and we would project into a shower with a, with a made up screen so the players could see it. And we didn't know whether this was going to work or not. And then as soon as we stopped one week, uh, the players demanded it. So they wanted to see it. It became a part of their match day preparation and something that they wanted to see. And I think in all honesty with you, it wasn't even so much about the, the information we were given about the opposition. It was more to see whether they were actually going to feature in the Good Feel movie at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. But, uh, but that, that then goes into your, so your warm up and then obviously the, the, the assistant, two assistants, uh, assistant coach, uh, second assistant, that they would lead the, the warm up. Um, one would be actually be my goalkeeping coach as well, who would also then look after the goalkeepers. The goalkeepers would actually come in for part of that warm up in pressure preparation for us, sort of like the tactical component that we'd actually run through very, very briefly. Um, and then back into to the changing rooms uh, and ready for kickoff. Kickoff uh, would go. And exactly as Andy just mentioned there, that first 10 minutes is critical to actually understanding has everything that you've planned and prepared in the week come into life out on the park? Are they setting up the way that you expected them to set up? 
are the individuals that you thought might make the difference going to be starting to feel their way into the game and get themselves there? And we have to be mindful of that. Or have you got it completely wrong and you've got to actually think outside of the box and think what, what are we going to do now? So understanding that they might have changed whatever it may be. And then the roles and responsibilities would be for the... Uh, I would sit to the right of the bench, the first assistant to the left of me, second assistant, next one down. They would both have whiteboards. One would actually be in charge of the shape of the opposition. The other one would be in charge of the shape of us in terms of what we're doing. Uh, on, they would flip their boards over. And when it comes to actually making notes, I'd be scribbling notes down in that first 10 minutes, but I'd actually be talking to them as well as to what we're actually seeing. And they would feed back to me and they would be collecting dot points on the back of those whiteboards um, as to good, bad or indifferent. Or is it what we expected it to be? Um, and then when we come into that lead up to, to half time, the five minutes before half time, we're actually talking through uh, potentially what are going to be the, the three key messages that we actually want to deliver at half time. As soon as the half time whistle would go, um, we wouldn't rush into the change room. We'd probably leave the first five minutes for the players. Um, a lot of the time there would be some high emotions running uh, certainly in that performance phase get the players into the change room give them an opportunity to settle down the physio might be in the change well, would be in the changing room as well and there might be players that needed treatment but when it actually comes to actually delivering my key messages I wanted to make sure there wasn't anyone on the treatment table they're actually in the room so they could hear that what information was being given um, and then we would go in and, and I would deliver sometimes it would be no more than two minutes sometimes it might be three minutes for but never over five minutes in terms of information being delivered I think there's a tendency at times for coaches to to over deliver and think that they just need to to fill the space with words but that's your window of opportunity to try and ensure that when you go out in the second half you're going to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for so maximizing that window of opportunity some three key take-homes whether it be when we have the ball when they have the ball in the transition moment whatever it may be but short sharp concise and then what we would do is we'd actually break off first assistant second assistant and myself and we might then have individual talks to the players depending whether we're dealing with goalkeepers defense midfielder attack sometimes you wouldn't have to do anything sometimes only one of us would need to deliver that to a couple of individuals um, but we were very very clear on what our roles were as individuals to support the, the collective team effort going out into the second half um, and then uh, second half would play out um, and we always plan to play uh, the not just 90 minutes, but we, we always plan to play 95, 96, 97 minutes, uh, noting that the, 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 uh, the time that will be played over, etc., and getting the players into that mindset as well. And then after the game, th there would be nothing from us in terms of information. Uh, again, trying to remove that emotion, players coming in. Uh, and then that would be where we would go through the review process, uh, the evaluation. So we've done plan, prepare. We've now done the conduct. The evaluation process would start as soon as that final whistle would finish. But that would be as a collective coaching staff. That wouldn't be with the players. And then we would actually go into a review um, on the, the Sunday if it was an active recovery or a Monday uh, again. But that would pretty much be, in a nutshell, the, the timeline that we would actually follow on match day. Thanks, Warren. And look, we'll, we'll get into some more of those details um, with, with these following questions. But, uh, you know, I think I think that's one of the things that we could probably pick up in, in the breakout rooms, people's own um, match day timelines, because obviously not everyone here will will be having their players two and a half hours before. So it'll be interesting to see how people manage their own their own match day um, timelines. Thanks, Warren. Gareth can, Gareth, can I just chip in? Lovely to. Because I think that, that was absolutely brilliant, that. It really was. And the thing I liked about the first 10 minutes was the, sec the assistant and second assistant doing that work. Um, one, one of the things we've just done this week, with our, well, last week with our under-18s, because obviously it's lockdown, um, trying to get players out. And it's a sort of a question for Warren. Warren, do you ever have players that pick up those type of tactical nuances quicker than the coaching staff? Yeah, 100%. Um, and we would certainly... We, I mean, we had a, a, a senior sort of uh, leadership group um, and then we had players in, in that sub-elite environment that actually come down from the A-League. So they dropped down a level. So they already had a wealth of football knowledge. Yeah. And, and we would actually you'd be using potentially those players to come off the bench and make an impact. And I would yeah. lean on those because of the level of their football knowledge. And if they had something to say, they wouldn't take it to me, but they would certainly pass it on to the second assistant. It would like be a like coming up the line, chain of command, if you will, if you, if you take yeah. it. Yeah. But certainly leaning on them for information 100%. 
Yeah, brilliant. Because that's where, I'd, sorry Gareth, to, to hijack this, but this is the way I was going with that. So the exercise we did with under 18s, I spoke to our under 18s coach. And obviously when the championship season was suspended, our first team would do to have nine remaining fixtures. So we, we split the 18s off into smaller groups and asked them to prepare a game plan to play against one of those opposition who the, the first team would have played in, in the forthcoming games. Um, so it's getting the kids forward thinking to look at these tactical things that Warren's on about there. And then hopefully we're going to try and get them into the habit of looking at tactical things earlier, quicker, so that whilst you do your briefing prior to the game, they go on the pitch and we go back to what I said about emotions and feeling the game. They're in amongst it. They feel it. So they might see the opposition set up. They might see the, the way the opposition nuanced way of changing a little bit of a player system or something like that. They might pick it up and feel it quicker than we see it. And, and therefore, some of the work we're doing is to try and get, particularly the under-18s, starting to look for those patterns early in the game. Yeah, just no, to, sorry, Gareth, just to add to that, just very, very quickly, mate, I apologise. No, how I jack away, I, I like it. I, I had to, to do this um, because the reality was this was my first year in Sydney. So I didn't know what the, the level was to a, to, to a certain extent, but there'd been players that, were, that I was now coaching that had played in this league for the last seven, eight years. Um, and they would actually know who the players were, what they were, what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were, what potentially. So I lent on them. And as part yeah. of that plan and prepare, we would actually whiteboard on a Monday and we would get the senior group to actually come up with, how do you think they're going to set up? And, it, and it for, certainly for the first 11 rounds, that's the process that we followed. After that, I'd seen enough to sort of then be able to, yeah, still lean on them. But certainly in that first 11 rounds that we played, it, it was absolutely critical for me to get that information and dissect that. I wouldn't use it all. Obviously, you would say take, take everything and then just drip feed it in. Uh, but that was a massive part of our overall process for sure. Thank you, guys. And the, the less I have to talk, the, the better for everyone. So, yeah, just, <laughs> just jump, jump, jump in on each other. Uh, Andy, I, I'm going to move sort of the second yeah. half of, of the game, really. And I'm... I'm interested in, you know, maybe, you know, you speak, speak personally from your experience or, or speak for your, your coaches in, in the academy, yeah. but what are the considerations when looking to possibly change players or systems during the game? And you've already said that the football's about winning and that's, that's exactly right, but are there some decisions where you have to weigh up well, the player development whilst trying to get the positive result? Yeah, um, like I said, the, the winning is important for, for, the, for the kids and for us, but I think the process is important. And the considerations for this are, you look for your foundation phase, so your youngest ones, for those in Australia, the foundation phase would be in fact 9 to 11 years old, and then 12 to 16 would be youth development, and then your professional development after that. So I think as you go up the ladder, so to speak, and it gets towards performance level, so we're trying to prepare players for first-team football, ultimately, there's, there's probably a little bit more of fixing and... and tactical work from the coaches but for me it's again going back to your game plan what did you want to achieve what were your intended outcomes for the game therefore that probably does a lot of driving of your, your match day management and stuff like that um, in, in terms of the younger ones you've probably pre-planned quite a bit of it in terms of probably equal game time or the relevant game time and swapping and things like that but if I can answer it's probably answering a question here might help um, so Aaron Cusack and Aaron's asking a question about Floodley Cup and do we ever select players on merit and teams on merit and make substitutions on merit? Um, the answer's got to be yes, because one of the things I'm really clear on is the first time players experience things cannot be in the professional development phase or in the first team. We've got to prepare them for that, not being selected, not getting match minutes, because there might come an occasion when that happens. So there will be some management of that in terms of you're going you're gonna to player but you'll be on the bench and if it's Floodlit Cup and we've decided as a club that's a priority for us in terms of the under-15s we want them to get through the group stages or into the knockout rounds of that competition there might be some boys who don't get many match minutes and then we then discuss why and going back to the plan to review that would be something that's done one-to-one -one with them but also we, we would dig into the, what they need to do that's the, the Van Persie clip has anybody seen the Van Persie clip recently talking about his son yeah, that's quite an interesting yeah. clip so that's the context of what we would do if, if we had a player that hasn't played in a Floodlit Cup game, for instance. We would probably sit down afterwards, talk to him why, and then explain the things he's probably got to do to force his way in for the next game or the next round, or whatever that might be. Um, but during the in-game management stuff goes back to your plan, but also things like if, if it's trying to pursue a victory, the, you've got that choice of do you leave the players that are on the pitch in the struggle? 
going back to the, the Phil Jackson thing for the basketball, I know he had the best team in the world when he was for the Chicago Bulls, but he spoke very well of trusting the players and leaving them in the struggle sometimes because if you trust your players, they'll come through for you. And it's a t sometimes it's counterintuitive for us as coaches because we think, tell you what, we can fix this by changing the system, putting a couple of subs on, whatever it might be. But actually, for this group, actually, we're going to leave them in it and let them see what they come up with and leave them to struggle because we know there'll be some longer-term benefits to that. But it's counterintuitive for us as coaches and it means we might not win that particular game, which then means we have to understand the process is more important than that particular game. Um, I did some calculations last night. I was trying to find it in terms of um, the amount of contact time we'll have with kids, depending on where you are in the world. If you're training once, twice, three, four times a week and then a game at weekend, we're going to have anywhere between 640 and something like 1,600 contact points with your players. So you don't have to fix everything there and then. It can, it can wait. So leave them in the struggle. You might change, change some. It's a reward for some of the players. So we had a recently group of under-15s because of injuries in the under-18s group. We put some under-15s on the bench, good players. They came on, no real expectations of them. It was a reward for their performances within the 15 group during the course of the season. They came on, impacted the game fantastically. Two of them scored, one created two goals, and, and we won the game. That was, we could have left them on the bench because it was under 18s. They were there just as backup. But actually, the under 18s coach made the choice, no, you know what, let's sling them on and give them it as a reward. And, and that's what he did. And they came through with goals and assists, and it was a fantastic thing. Um, Another, another interesting thing to consider, and, and again, Warren, working at the level he's worked at, will be interesting, is do we ever leave our best players on the bench? Because for us in, in our game, the chances are some of the boys eventually come through and make a first-team debut, it's likely to be off the bench. So they've never prepared for that. So again, don't let that be the first time they've done it. So one of the conversations I've had, with, I've just moved to Leeds in November, as you know, and one of the conversations we're starting to have with the, the coaching staff is, as the players come through the youth development phase towards the professional development phase, do we actually put some of our better players on the bench and ask them to come on with 20 minutes to go and impact a game? So that's already forming part of our planning. But what we've got to do is make sure we talk to the boys and say, look, this is going to happen today, next week and the week after, because this may well happen to you as you progress towards the first team or the 18s or the under 23s and then the first team. Chances are you're going to be asked to come off the bench and make an impact or secure a game for us if, if that's what your job's going to be. Um, so that's an interesting one for me. And then it all comes through to reviewing again, reviewing again afterwards. So did the outcome look like the game plan? If so, brilliant. We'll take whatever we can into the next game. If it didn't, why? And if, again, we can then do something about fixing that. Again, it all comes back to me. Is There's no finish line in coaching. There's no, we're all learning. There's no, I know what I'm doing now, 100%. There's no end point for us. It's all a process of planned and review and providing people spend the time reviewing and reflecting with the intention of improving themselves and improving the players that they're working with. That's the most important bit for me. So I, I've talked for ages there, not really answered your question. What are the considerations? <laughs> um, does, it, does, it fit, does it fit the game plan? Have you planned for it? And if so, does it look like what you expected? And if not, it's that moment. And Warren's probably better prepared to answer this question than me, working at first team level, is when you're stuck there, and it's tough, and you've got to get your three points, or you've got to get through the next round of the cup, what do you do? And ultimately, it'll come down, going back to emotion as well. So coaches will be, they'll have fight, flight or freeze within their character. So some will stand there on the touch line, they'll freeze not knowing what to do. Obviously, some of them will roll the sleeves up and fight it and have a right good go. And others will be fearful and run away from making the decisions. I'd rather coaches make a decision, and then in the review afterwards can give me a rationale as to why they've done what they've done. Because providing they're making decisions, you can always then start to keep getting better. When people freeze and don't like making decisions or they're fearful of that, then we've got some more work to do. Thank you. Honestly, the questions are only designed to, to, to get you talking. So uh, they're, they're good questions, I reckon. Um, and I like the fact, you know, I have the game plan, but don't feel you've got to fix everything in, in that one game yeah. or over the, the next you know, week or so. I like that. That's good yeah. advice. Um, Adam, um, interested in the you know the, the bit of coaching that, that I must admit I never really thought about. You just you just did and didn't have much support with. It's the it's the three team talks on match day, the pre match, the half time, the post match. 
from your experience, you know, what, what are the purpose of those talks and, and maybe give us an insight into what they might look like? Yeah, well, I think um, Warren gave uh, a real insight in terms of what a, a match day sort of looks like for him. And uh, I, I could relate to a lot of it, to be honest, because um, in terms of the way that it was structured and, and the different parts to it and what they looked like, uh, were very similar, to be honest. Uh, I think naturally, pre-game, it's exactly that. You know, you're, you're planning for obviously the upcoming game. Um, you're hoping a lot of that work would have been covered in terms of uh, all elements of the game, you know, technically, tactically, physical, and, and then the social side and psychological um, leading up to the game. So in terms of your working week and the way that you're structuring your practices and your sessions and, and working towards uh, the weekend, uh, we've tended to try to do our, I guess, our, our pre-game meeting. We tend to do it the day before the game. Um, so before the boys are dismissed sort of on a Friday afternoon, that'll be sort of the main time where we'll have the team meeting where we go through, I guess, uh, team objectives, individual objectives for the weekend and any specific sort of tactical patterns. Um, and that would have led on from obviously the training session either beforehand. And, and sometimes we even do it before, you know, to sort of lead into the work that we're going to be doing. So we sort of play around with that as well. Uh, and, and then very much on the match day, uh, there'll be sort of an initial short team meeting at the start before the lads are, are getting changed. And, and that will very much be around similar to what Warren was talking about with a lot of use of video analysis, uh, you know, just taking two, three clips from the working week around uh, how you want the team to play and you want the individuals to play. Um, so that would just sort of be positive reinforcement from training sessions, from games sort of leading into the game. So very, very much visual based and there may be one or two points spoken about by coaches, or that would just be sort of reinforcement and consolidating, you know, the work and what's been discussed in the week as well. Uh, and, and then I feel that it's important, you know, we all need to remember whatever level we played the game, you know, how we felt as players. But I just feel that period that the lads have in the changing room in terms of their preparation is, is key. Uh, and if, if the work has been done, if, if the working week is right, I feel then the players need that sort of space to prepare themselves going into the warm-up and then going into the game. So I think the last thing you want to do as a coach is to be, you know, too, sort of too energetic or too much around the players, you know, too often uh, prior to the game starting. Uh, because I also think that that can show a degree of sort of I don't know, nervousness or anxiety and sort of make things a little bit edgy. So we try and keep it sort of short, sharp, use positive reinforcement, uh, leading obviously into the time where, where the lads are in the changing room and, and then the game obviously starts. But there, there may be one or two sort of key things that you prompt individual players with and uh, we all look like that sort of traditional positive message before the lads sort of go out to play. Uh, but that would very much be it sort of uh, pre-game. Um, yeah, half-time, again, very similar to Warren where... It's obviously, you can have a structure in terms of how you want to give team talks and you can have a plan as to the type of things that you want to say. But uh, naturally, the thing that we love about football, you're always going to see something different and it's going to show up uh, some different challenges for you to sort of take on board. So that's, that's very much those two or three minutes sort of as the halftime whistle goes and you get together with your group of coaches and you're discussing what you've seen and things that you're going to potentially talk about in the halftime team talk. You know, I, I do feel that that's really critical. Um, I've seen, e even now, I see so many sort of coaches going, you know, for instance, if me and Andy are taking a team, uh, I'll go in and I'll talk about what I've seen and, and make points on various areas of the game. And then Andy will go in and, and do the same. And what you tend to find is nine times out of 10, you're probably saying the same thing twice and you're lacking some real clarity in terms of your delivery in, in, at half time. So we, we very much try to keep things, you know, two to three big points and, and try and link it to the themes in terms of the work that's being done and, and the game plan that's been set. Uh, and, and, and also there's, there's no harm in, from, for me in terms of asking the players, you know, one or two players, within the team before you start talking 
you know, uh, what's your thoughts on the half or uh, how do you think things are going? And that can sort of tend to lead how you sort of go into your discussions with the players as well. So uh, that, that will obviously be man managed. And, and after the game, uh, listen, we love football. It's very passionate. You know, uh, there's so much emotion and feeling around it. Uh, essentially, if it's a losing changing room, whatever you're going to say, really, the players are dejected, the feeling, the emotion of it, how much is realistically going to go in. And, and if you've won and you've got three points, then everyone feels brilliant and you're elated. So uh, it, it would very much be a follow-up in terms of a coach's assessment, in terms of watching the game back and, and dissecting it. And then there would be a team review and individual analysis with players in terms of their performance and, and how they felt things have gone as well. So I think spending time with players post-game in terms of them personally, I think can be very powerful. And then naturally there may be two or three big things, you know, in terms of how the game panned out that you want to get across to the players as well. And uh, I think something for everyone to think about in this, this topic is I, I've also found coaches to be very reflective when things have not gone wrong, uh, right. Sorry. So when games have been lost, when we feel there could be something that we've done better, we become quite obsessive about breaking the game down and going into the detail where I find when things have gone well or we've got three points or we've been the better team and we've got the better players, you know, everyone sort of pats themselves on the back and, and we move on to the next game. Uh, but I'd really stress and encourage any sort of coach, you know, to really look at that and review that side of the game as well, because for you to understand why the game's gone well, uh, you know, why have you individually got better players? How were you able to impose your style of play on the opposition? For players and coaches and staff to understand the process of that can also be very good for, for learning and, and future development. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Really comprehensive. I'm, um, I'm going to upset Warren because I'm going to ask his, his question at the moment. Um, but we'll come back to it, Warren. The, re the reason being is I, I think there's so much information there that I'd like the, uh, the, the, the people... Um, watching and listening to have a chance to dissect it and apply it to their, their, their own context. So we will come back to that question, Warren. Okay, so don't get upset with me, mate. Um, but also, uh, Drew, it means it means you've had less time to think about uh, the summary. Are you, are you ready or would you like to come back and do that later? Have you picked up a couple of sort of common themes or interesting points? Yeah, yeah. Happy to happy to give it a go now. There's been there's been a lot. I think you've I think you've uh, done it well there because the, the breakout rooms will be brilliant with what's there. So for me, I guess the, the key bit to, um, across everybody, so that importance of the plan do review um, and that being done regardless of the outcome of the game, um, the role of your staff both during the week and during the game and having some real clarity for everybody and how they're going to work together. Um, also linking into the work being done in the week. So on the game day, there's potentially a minimum retention from the players themselves right before they're sort of going, walking out onto the pitch. Um, and then a key bit that come through as well, coaches are people too. So the game's a learning tool for them as well. So that also links in um, uh, a bit around the, the equal game time, potentially needing to be uh, balanced with the needs of players. So is what they actually need to have equal game time and is equal necessarily fair uh, I thought that, that really resonated with me. And then uh, I guess also in terms of structures of especially halftime talks to, to keep it clear, uh, probably three main points, but also that piece that depending on the stage of development, whether that would link purely to the match itself or also partly to the week or training cycle that you're working on and the individual and collective uh, needs of the players um, on that game day. Brilliant. Thanks, Drew. Good, good summary. It leads us nicely. Look, I'm going to share my screen. I know people that have been with us most of the time understand how the breakout um, rooms work, but I'll, I'll just give a bit of context so that we can maximise the, the, the 10 minute half time uh, that we have in these um, in our breakout rooms. OK, so when you when you get in the breakout room, yeah, definitely chuck your camera and your microphones on. If, if you can, the more people chat in, the, the better conversation. Um, that we have, we they they're not recorded, so we ne you know we don't know what goes on in there. 
um, but you know, if people do, uh, if the people do pop in, then you know, if, if for example Andy and Adam are in your room, then try not to grill them anymore. Give them a rest. Let them let them listen to your conversations. Um, look, you talk about what you want in there. You know, pick up on on anything that, that the guys have spoken about. If you need a prompt, there's a few prompts there that I've, I just thought um, before. How does your coaching on match day reflect your philosophy as a coach? Um, but are there bits that might clash? You know, we, we might think that we we have a certain philosophy or practice as a coach, but there might be some things on game day on, on game day that you think think clash. You can chat about that. I would really like when we come out of the room to have as much of the, the next point in the chat room as possible, which is really simple. What do you do on match day that has really helped players? So, you know, therefore, when I look at the transcript of the chat at the end, we've got a whole list of good practice of what, what people are doing that really helps the players. But again, don't be guided by those that just if, if you go in there and, the, you know, you have an awkward silence, someone's got to jump in and uh, start the conversation. Thank you, guys. OK, um, look, we, we tried this last week. And I, I thought it was a really good addition where we just had a couple of people just give a sort of 30 second snapshot of of their the main discussion that went on in there in their um, breakout room. So, so we'll give it a go again. Um, hopefully these people are here. If these people aren't here, then just be ready because I could be coming to the first name that I see. But uh, Karim, are you here, mate? I am, yep. Excellent, Karim. Well, Karim, will you chuck on your uh, your camera if you can and, and give us a, a summary of your of the discussion in your room? Yeah, definitely. Um, I thought it was really great. Um, we were talking a lot about um, bringing your subs in at half time. So if, you, if you're playing on a pitch where um, you're able to leave your subs out, do you bring them in for the halftime talk? Do you, do you leave them out? Do you give them that feedback while you're coming back onto the pitch? Um, and utilising things like a couple of coaches are utilising dynamic stretching while doing their halftime talk. So just keeping the players engaged and how best you do that. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go, I'll go to Adam, just, just Adam on this. Adam, what do you do with your, the, the answer to Karim's sort of uh, subs there? Do you leave them out or do you bring them in for the talk? I'll unmute you, sorry, mate. There you go. I, I always... Uh, sorry. No, we can hear you, you're good. I, I think as, as much as you can involve the whole group as possible, um, that, that can only be a positive thing. I think it all depends as well on the age group that you're working with because... I think when you're working with the youngest players, you know, to have the group there uh, and have the, the subs involved in discussions and, and the talk can be great. And, and also them adding into what you're doing as well. Um, naturally, as you sort of go up the ladder in terms of the age groups, uh, then you've, you sort of use that period for players to warm up in or prepare to potentially come on. Uh, however, if there's a player that's going to be coming onto the pitch quite soon uh, where you feel you're going to make a change, then it's important then for that player to also be involved in, in the team talks that are happening. Um, as, as well, where you've obviously got, uh, with the younger age groups, you're making lots of changes at sort of uh, different points of the game. Well, not lots, but at more intervals. Um, it's, it's always good to sort of have that collective and have everybody involved. Definitely, in terms of learning. Thank you, Adam. Karim, thank you very much for that, mate. Um, one more room summary. Uh, Peter Narokowski, can you uh, give us a summary of your room? Nice to meet you, by the way. Great to see everyone. Um, so, yeah, really good chat in room two. We actually had a great mix of play uh, people from the academy setups as well as grassroots setups and kind of these... Um, just a really good crossover. So basically we had Mick who looks at Hunter Valley Association. He talks about how you might not have a whole lot of coaching, the coaches there to be able to help you out. So instead he talks about um, having a lot of players leading the discussions, whether it's your, your pre-game team talk, whether it's your halftime talk, um, trying to involve the players into that coaching process as much as possible. Uh, then we had two academy coaches from West Brom and Leeds who talked about having measurable goals, having individual kind of targets so that when these players turn up for their IDP chats in six weeks' time, then they can say, look, we were doing these things during the match day and we were able to get the highlights to be able to prove that we're meeting these small goals, whether it's a small group or a small individual target or whatever it is, but then it's player-driven. 
Um, and probably the most important words which were kind of said in our group was rather than having the, the saying of find the free player to play to, in, instead have the freedom to say, look, look for the free option. And you can't get the decision-making process opened up that way. So, yeah, room two was a great chat. So thank you very much to everyone in room two for that one. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Um, look, just listening to that makes me it makes me pleased that we, we stick with the, the breakout rooms. You know, you, you got a chance to chat with not coaches from across the, across the world, but different contexts as well. We, like I said at the beginning, there's, there's there are no disrespect to the panel, but there is a, you know more experience and, and ideas out off the panel than there is on the panel. So it would be silly not to listen to, to people as well. Um, brilliant. Um, Chris, you've been monitoring the, the, the chat. Um, maybe we'll aim for, for three sort of killer questions that you, that you found there. Yeah, not, not a problem, Gareth. Um, we've, we've got a couple. I'm going to mix it up again slightly. And there's a few we've tapped on the shoulder that have sent their questions in to uh, unmute themselves and come on. So uh, David Stadden, who's logging in from Bournemouth, has got a great question if you want to uh, unmute yourself and get yourself uh, on camera, David. Yeah, perfect. Morning, guys. Really great discussion as always. Uh, so my question was uh, to all the panel or whoever wants to answer it, really is how do you balance giving information to improve performance whilst allowing the players to still figure it out for themselves? In particular, I suppose, across that, that foundation phase where we feel like they may, well, we probably will have more answers than them. Okay, as soon as it went quiet, Andy, I'm going to give you that one. Yeah, because I, I, I think I touched on that in my, what I would do during substitutions and things like that. But how, the howness, I, I think... You've got to keep going back to, in training sessions, people are very clear that we've got to give players the opportunities to self-correct. Yet suddenly when we come to a match day, it seems to have a significant increase in tariff for a mistake and therefore we're quick to try and fix it, solve it, give the player the information that they might need to fix it next time. I'll give an example. So recent weeks, or towards the end of, before we went on lockdown at Leeds, I was watching a game with one of our coaching staff and... My, my simple feedback to him was, I know what you know, but I don't know what the players know. And, and the message to him was, look, you've got great knowledge, but can you try and use it in a different way to help the players in the future rather than try and fix everything from there and now? And this was a youth development phase age group. So I, I think you've got to give the players the opportunity to self-correct, understanding, like I said, that, that particular one game is part of a process. And then you, your work you then do is you do your one-to-one -one meetings with the kids, you build something into them in terms of their individual um, learning plan or their individual working. Like for us, we have the kids in three, four times a week. During the course of the following week, the following weeks, you can do something. It's about seeing, if you're seeing a, the consistent mistake on a number of match days, then it's probably you probably need to start to fix within the context of a match day. But you've got to first of all give the player the opportunity within the game. That's it. That's Thank you. So, so, so you're looking, sorry, Dave, so you're looking for patterns. If you see the same mistake in week two that you've seen in week one, likewise in week four from week one, you're probably going to yourself, I'm seeing that too often now. But within the context of one of a one-off game, it's probably something I would know, but then talk to the player on or work with the player afterwards. Yeah, I think it's really refreshing from a coach development point of view, such as yourself, that you give your coaches the chance to not coach in a way. I know a lot, a lot of other environments are, well, why has that player made that mistake? Why haven't you fixed this? And then he's making that mistake and that player's making that mistake. How yeah. are you fixing that? And I think it's really refreshing from a coach to hear someone in your position say, you know what, actually, let them go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. great. Thank you. It's, it's, yeah, it's my, my belief. And because I don't come from the world of academia, I come from the world of football. What I've tried to do is I come with my biases as a coach developer so I, all I keep doing is trying to check my own biases and go, is this the right way? So what I've done is I've, I've gone out and, and I've read and I've talked to people and it's a fundamental belief of mine that you've got to give players the opportunity to self-correct in games as well as training because we know there's the long-term benefits for it are, are there and there's evidence to say so. And that's the other thing is where I can get evidence to support the things I think. I try and do that so then it gives me the rationale for why I say things like this this morning. Thank you, Andy. David, thank you for your question. Another one, Chris? Yeah, we've got uh, Trevor Fatore from Sydney. Trev, if you want to come on and ask your question, mate. G'day, guys. How are you going? Um, yeah, my question, uh, Andy, just relates to that um, bit of um, leaving them in the struggle um, that you spoke about before. 
bit about what Dave said there. I guess I found myself in times where you're seeing something where it's not going right. Um, do we leave them in the struggle? Do we fix it? You, you feel under pressure to f make that fix. I, I just wondered if you mentioned you had a good result on one, but I wondered if you had a, a example where it just totally tanked and <laughs> how you reviewed that and, you know, did you learn anything from it? Is that for me? Yeah, yes, Andy. Yeah. 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 Plenty of them. Plenty of them. I, I have, um, one, I was, I was coaching the, the county juniors, so the under 18, so it would be for you a district side, I would think, or a state side, the equivalent of that. So the under 18s, and we were playing in a national competition. And that, that was my stance was we were struggling in a, in a cup competition. And I, there's a build on to that as well. Um, we were struggling in a cup competition. I didn't think it was appropriate to put the substitutes on because to expose them to that game would have been unfair because it was, it was a shocker. We were playing, I think we were about six or seven down, weren't playing very well. And it was one of them where you go, right, are they realistically going to fix this now in a national competition? The answer was probably no. And it was a case of I needed the boys that were in the game to, to feel what it felt like to really, really struggle. And then what I did afterwards, I spoke to them about ownership, about preparing and the things that they do, that the minimum requirement when you're, when you're getting beat six or seven in a national competition is that you show some commitment, you support your teammates, mm. you work together. Those type of things were becoming fractured because of the, result, the score at the time. And it wasn't fair to put the substitutes into that environment. And I had that conversation with them as to why. Everybody would think, well, you're six or seven down. You've got to put some subs on to fix this. Yeah. Well, actually, for me, it was unfair on the substitutes to say, go on and sort this out because it was so far gone. Like, it was unrealistic. So I spoke to them and said, look, you won't be going on today, but I think we had a game 10 days later in a, in a regional competition. Um, and I said to them, but you will start because that will be your opportunity now at representative level to stake a claim for the rest of the season. We then played the game 10 days later and between then we'd have two training sessions and I talked to the boys about ownership and minimum expectations, support your mates. And gave a little bit of ownership to the captain, like we've talked to you about giving the, the, the team some ownership, give the captain ownership. We didn't win the game. It was at Sheffield. We lost the game, but there was... You sort of pat yourself on the back and go, there was an improvement in performance. Well, actually, that wasn't down to me, that was down to the players because I gave it over to them. So, yeah, absolutely. And then we could sit and talk about it numerous other times when it's tanked, but it's a belief that longer term is better for the players. Mm. No, spot on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for your question, Trevor. Chris, have we, have we got one more maybe for Adam and Warren? Yeah, cheers, cheers, Trevor. Um, so, just a one uh, from from Joshua uh, from from Sydney. So we'll throw it to throw it to Adam and Warren. Um, Warren, if you want to go first, and then we'll hand over to Adam. Uh, so it's it's around the use of match analysis um, and video feedback for players and the team. Do you think that us as coaches leverage that as much as possible when it comes to match day and feedback? No. Um, I think it's it's massive and it, and it needs to be used as a, as an opportunity. Um, we've talked a lot within this particular uh, session about objective evidence and subjective beliefs. Um, I think if we tap into the analysis, that gives us a, a, an opportunity to provide objective evidence as to why we might go down one avenue versus another. Um, and then certainly from a, a youth development point of view and, and the stage of development that you're actually working in, um, I think it's important to provide uh, the younger players examples of top level players executing um, and showing very, very good positive examples of that. And then going the other way, showing uh, top level players where they need to, to improve potentially um, and, and how you actually manage that and then what information you give. I think it's in incredibly important, but I, I certainly do feel that we don't do enough of it. Um, and understand how to do it. And, and again, sometimes it's easy to say we, we, we don't know how to do it ourselves, but certainly if you can bring somebody in that does have that skill set to be able to provide uh, snippets or, or uh, small parts of the game, again, using the past, present and future, like I say, will, will aid massively as part of your overall development, regardless of the stage of development that you're actually in. Thanks, Warren. Um, Adam, over to you. Yeah, no, I think very similar to Warren. And uh, I think the use of video analysis is it's, it's not frequent enough within the game, but it's definitely something that's increased, particularly over the last sort of two to three years in terms of a learning and development tool. 
you know, first of all, as coaches, if, if you take part in the game um, and, and then you watch the game back and you reflect on it, uh, no matter how long you've been in the game or how experienced you are, you know, it will show you something different to how you felt at that period. So you, you end up looking at the game potentially in a slightly, you know, different way. Um, and even things for coaches, I think I saw a question in the chat uh, just around sort of coaching behaviours. So, you know, what, what do you look like on, on the touchline? Uh, what are your emotions like throughout the game and what sort of body language are you then sort of radiating and putting onto the players? There, there are other ways in which, which we can use in coach development to, to sort of reflect on. And, and then for players, I just think it's so positive, you know, just in terms of what Warren said, uh, looking at your best players, your favourite players, you know, if you're working on certain techniques or certain aspects of the game, for you to really positively reinforce that. Um, and then for the players to, to obviously see footage of them doing it or things that they need to aspire to, I just think are so powerful. Um, I think, I guess, the way the sort of game's going with it or any coach that uses it, is understanding when to use it and have a real purpose as to why you're doing it, you know, because as, as much as you can sort of give too much information verbally to players and communicate, you can also give too much in terms of analysis. You know, you, you can see meetings go on for 20, 30 minutes, uh, going through numerous rooms of clips, and there you then question how much learning or how much the players are actually taken on board. So... Uh, I, I use the phrase sort of little and often with it, where if you're using it frequently, but just little snippets and hopefully powerful images, um, then then that can be positive for the players in the group. Awesome, thank you. I, again, I know we could we could go all day, and uh, we have to have a time when we when we sort of um, have a our first finish. So, so what's going to happen is is I'm going to do a little bit of. Um, sharing of the screen and, and talking about what's coming up next week because we've got a little bit of change to the schedule next week some really exciting stuff happening um and then for those who and then i'll say thank you to our, our panelists and then those who want to and are able to stay behind then like i said we have that, that 10 minute um session where people can stay stay behind and chat you know as we said like like the workshops finished the coach education workshops finished where people hang around and and chat so let me just share the the screen um just a couple of adverts really to start with. Um, everybody here must have heard of In the Technical Area podcast now, going strength to strength. Um, and again, I'm not going because of time, I'm not going to get give the, the, the lads an option to, to talk about it uh, this week. But I would say uh, definitely uh, download it and listen to some outstanding um, um, podcasts on there. The other one is a little advert from me, a club I'm involved with, um, Stanmore Hawks. We have a, a vacancy for under 13s head coach. Um, so if someone has a C license and they live near the inner West Sydney and are interested in that, then please contact me. Okay. And... All right. So moving on to next week, next Monday, again, we, 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 we're keeping the, the standard really, really high. Um, we're looking at characteristics of effective coaches, which is a clearly a theme that's run throughout all our four previous uh, webinars, but we'll be looking at that in a bit more detail. And we're very lucky to have, uh, Dr. Kerry Bowley, Head of Coaching Support at City Football Group, join us. City Football Group, for those that don't know, is the, the group that is um, obviously involved with Manchester City, uh, Melbourne City, uh, New York City and, and, and clubs across the world. So um, Kerry will be a great, great, great person to speak on effective coaches and what they look for. We're also really lucky to have Michael Cooper, um, Australia's under-17 national team assistant coach, um, join us. Um, and you know, having having spoken with, with both Kerry and Michael before, I know we're in for a real uh, deep discussion around what effective coaching uh, could be and what effective coaches is our two two real students of the game. And of course, we have our, our very own excellent Chris Adams, who's going to join us um, to complete that panel um, on Monday. So the times to be confirmed, but we're pretty confident it will be the same time um, as today. So again. Look out for that on social media. Um, I will try and send an email so people can register direct, but I'll definitely have a look out for that. And then we've got a something extra. 
So I know the Monday Night Coaches Club is confusing for people in the UK because it's uh, Monday morning. Well, we're going to confuse it even more by having a session on a Wednesday. So on Wednesday the 20th, the Monday Night Coaches Club will, will be on a Wednesday. And but this, this is really from demand, really. Um, football in Australia is starting to return. It's returned in Western Australia and South Australia and I, I believe the Northern Territories. Um, and we believe it's going to return soon to, to other parts of Australia. Um, but it, it's not returning as of yet like it did before. So there are, there are restrictions on what we can do. Limited areas, limited numbers, uh, limited practices that, that we can do. And, and we feel coaches um, would benefit some, for some help on that. So we've got Rob Sherman um, and obviously the, the, the people in Australia and, and New Zealand and, and Wales uh, will certainly know Rob. Rob is the formal technical director uh, for Football Federation Australia and, and for New Zealand football. So Rob is really keen, keen to share his thoughts around what we can do to continue excellent coaching dur during this time. Uh, we, we may have other guests um, to be confirmed, but we thought we'd, we'd, we'd alert you to it um, now before we've got all of the details. So again, uh, keep an eye out for that, but pencil that in um, for Wednesday the 20th of May. Our plan for that is that we really try and run it as a workshop as well. And during and after the workshop uh, or the webinar, we, we create a resource, a resource of all the ideas of people that are on the webinar, as well as Rob, as well as uh, the guys behind this, this webinar, and we will send that out. So we'll create a, a resource of, of ideas um, put together by the people on the webinar for the people on the webinar to hopefully give you some support as, as we return to, to, to training. So hopefully that, that will be useful. Um, so all that re remains for me to do is, is to, to thank our, our panel. Um, Andy, Adam and Warren really enjoyed that. Um, loads of thoughts that I've got written down here about my own uh, coaching on match day, which I must admit is an area I don't play enough to and I tend to go off the cuff too often. So loads of thinking for, for me. So Andy, thanks very much, mate. You're welcome. Gareth, if, um, just a quickie. If any of the people on here want to ask a question or just engage with me, away from this they can email me at andy.foster at legionated.com because there was a couple of questions i saw in the chat that i never got around to answering or speaking about so if anybody's got a question unanswered that i think i can help with just drop me an email thank you andy jerry very generous of you and adam great to meet you and, and really enjoyed listening to your, your thoughts on, on on coaching on match day thank you very much no thanks Gareth. i just uh i just wanted to mention to everyone really just around sort of coaching on match day and uh I think what we can't do as coaches is neglect or fail to understand the real importance of being positive and the messages, the empowerment that you give players to go and perform. You know, what we've hopefully spoken about, you know, all of us today with some practical ideas of what that may look like. But what will never change in coaching is your relationships with the players, your positive, your enthusiastic manner. And what you then inspire them to go and do will always be a critical part of, of training, coaching, match day and working with players. So that's, that's something that we should always keep in, in, in the back of our mind. Thank you, Adam. And um, thank Warren, you. thank you very much for your, your second appearance. I haven't forgotten that I've cut one of your questions and we'll start <laughs> the breakout rooms with, with, that, with that question, I promise, mate. But Warren, thanks. Great, great insight um, in, in, into, into match day coaching. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me again and thank you to the two gentlemen for presenting tonight. It's been really insightful and, and really rewarding again to be a part of this project, mate. Yeah, Warren, it's been great to meet you, mate. I've enjoyed your, your bit there with the, the match day lap time. It was brilliant. Thanks, mate. That's right. Thanks, Warren. Okay, so look, if, if people can and want to stay around, we'll be hanging around for 10 more minutes or so. Uh, I'll be asking Warren that, that question. Um, and then for those that want to, we, we can put you into breakout room. It'll be, unfortunately, I can't put you back into the same breakout room, but you'll, you'll be able to have conversations with people on, on, on stuff that we've discussed today. So for, for people that want to um, stay, stay with us. If not, have a lovely rest of your day, lovely evening, and hopefully we'll see you next Monday.